Welcome to History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, leave us a comment down below, and share this episode with a fellow history lover. And now, on to tonight's episode. Averill, Massachusetts, March 15, 1697. Thomas Dustin's frosty late winter morning is disrupted by what sounds like an approaching flock of seagulls coming towards the northwest corner of his settlement. Thomas is a father of nine, including just a days old newborn daughter. A talented brick mason, Thomas is hard at work building a new home just half a mile away from his current home. The brick home still stands to this day. It would become quickly apparent that the sound rumbling towards him was not that of ravenous seabirds, but rather an entity with a far more insatiable appetite. As the clatter of spears and hatchets and the hoops and hollers of the native Abenaki raiding tribe came into Thomas's view from atop the hill, it became clear they could only be headed towards one place, the homestead now occupied by his wife and children. The natives did not see Thomas Dustin as they galloped forth, and the Puritan patriarch knew he had little time to stage an improbable rescue of his family. Thomas mounted his steed and dashed through the trees parallel to the native's path towards his home until he reached the clay road that ran along his property. He dismounted and dashed forward, hopping the fence line to make his approach to the rear of the home. Pillars of black smoke rose into the misty morning sky from Abenaki torches, until suddenly they stopped in place. Thomas could only hear the desperate cries of a distant settler as the raiding party descended upon them in the road leading to his home. A single musket shot rang out, then the air fell silent for an extended moment before the Abenaki howls ramped up once more. As Thomas dug in his heels and tugged antagonistically on the mane of his horse, he could see the Abenaki raiders come into his field of vision once more. They were on foot now, a half dozen or so out front, heads half shaven, faces and chests coated in streaks of war paint, some in loincloths, others stark naked, carrying an array of deadly weapons, including hatchets, lances, heavy knives, and a couple of French muskets. Thomas Dustin took an advantageous angle that would deliver him home before the bloodthirsty warriors, as their pace had slowed as they labored up the steep incline en route to the Dustin homestead. The elder Dustin cried out to his children, Indians! as they stood in frozen disbelief, staring down upon the screeching marauders now closing in upon them. The children hurried back towards the house. Thomas called out to his oldest children, Thomas Jr. and Elizabeth, to head for the neighboring marsh house, a garrison located a mile away up on Pecker's Hill. Thomas burst into his home and shouted again, Indians! The warmth of the fireplace could be felt as the flames danced shadows onto the walls of the room. In her bed, lay his wife, Hannah, the 39-year-old matriarch of the Dustin clan. She had been bedridden since the birth of her twelfth child and the ninth that had yet survived just one week before. The infant's name is Martha. Hannah's nurse, Mary Neff, held the infant Martha in her hands. As she looked out the front window, her mouth agape at the image of the first warrior brandishing a French musket making his way to the clearing just a few dozen yards away. Mary was a widow in her fifties. She lived just a half mile away from the Dutton estate and frequently came to aid Hannah and her children. Thomas gave a quick look towards the side door of the home, signaling to Hannah and Mary to flee with the infant child once Thomas walked out to face the attackers through the front of the home. As Thomas crossed the threshold and stood at the precipice of his front porch, he saw a dozen Abenaki warriors, now angling towards the house from all sides, sprinting forward with reckless abandon. Thomas began to line the sights of his musket upon the nearest native warrior, but instead he quickly drew down his firearm and mounted his horse, foregoing the opportunity to shoot. The horse was directed towards Pecker's Hill, the path of which his eight other children would be frantically attempting to travel. As he rode out from his home, a young raider that was nearest to him flung a lance that narrowly missed the Puritan's head. Just after this, he heard the haunting war cries of the Abenaki, as they entered his home from behind him, and he fought to keep his mind focused on his young children, struggling somewhere up the hill before him. Once he crossed into the tree line, Thomas peered back upon his home. The raiding party had entered the home, and there he could not see Hannah or Mary anywhere inside the house. Four of the Abenaki, 
then rushed out of his front door and headed after Thomas. As Thomas Dustin's horse caught up to the children, he saw in the rear of the broken column his 11-year-old daughter and 12-year-old son as they stumbled and foundered, anxiously looking back over their shoulders, consumed with fear and worry. A ways ahead in front of them was his 19-year-old daughter, Hannah. Thomas was faced with a heart-wrenching decision. The greatest chance for survival was to grab one or two of the children and ride ahead to the garrison house. It would all but ensure that some of his children would survive. Yet this question that nodded his stomach was an impossible one to answer. Which of his children would he choose to rescue from this murderous onslaught? The precious seconds ticked away, but in the mind of Thomas Dustin, it felt as though time was standing still. Then, at once, the decision had been made. He called to his eldest son, Thomas Jr., and ordered him to gather all of the children and head directly to the garrison house atop Pecker's Hill. Either he would save them all, or the Dustin family would perish from the natural world together. While mounted upon his horse, Thomas Sr. scanned out upon the ground he had just covered for the approaching raiders. He clinched the paper end of a shot cartridge within his teeth, ready to reload as quickly as possible, and then, after cocking his musket, let out a holler and rode downhill into the fray. The first Abenaki appeared, running uphill towards Thomas Dustin. The native raider dropped his musket as Dustin rode directly towards him, and when the Abenaki attempted to leap from the path of the oncoming nag, Thomas kicked him in the head with a forceful blow. Two more warriors raced forward up the hill, side by side, one with an axe and the other a sharp pike. Thomas drew back snugly on the reins of his horse, then dismounted, favoring his shot with his feet planted stably on the ground. His sights honed in on the larger of the two, and wary of drawing his fire, the natives split apart, circling around him through the tree line. Thomas remounted and maneuvered his horse back up the hill, taking effort to place himself in between the advancing raiders and his children at all times. He kept the natives at bay as best he could, then rode uphill in search of his offspring. They were found just beneath the steepest pitch of the hill, the final stretch that led out into a clearing up to the garrison house. The youngest child, Jonathan, just a few years old, was falling behind. The other children tugged at his limbs in an effort to get him to keep up with the others, but the appearance of three Abenaki cresting the ridgeline just beneath them caused the elder children to let go of Jonathan in an effort to save themselves. As the raiders drew close to young Jonathan, Thomas Sr. rode out to him, dismounted from his horse, and aimed his musket upon the now hesitant Abenaki. Militiamen appeared atop the garrison, with musket barrels aiming down upon the natives. Suddenly, armed men burst through the front door of the hilltop fortification and stormed downhill toward the location of the standoff. On seeing this, the Abenaki scattered and retreated from the scene. The Dustin children arrived at the garrison's doorstep, exhausted yet relieved, and were carried safely into the imposing structure by its inhabitants. Thomas Dustin had saved all eight of his children that had fled out from his home that late winter morning, but the fate of his wife and his newborn daughter was still unknown. Just a quarter of a mile away, as Thomas Dustin had breathed an uneasy sigh of relief at their miraculous retreat to the garrison house, Hannah Dustin and her newborn child were being herded away from Haverhill like cattle at a blistering pace. Along with Hannah, the infant Martha, and their nurse Mary Neff, a handful of neighboring Puritans had also been captured and were now being prodded forth at the tips of Abenaki lances. Hannah and Mary still wore their nightgowns with double stockings and kerchiefs upon their heads as was customary. Author Cotton Mather would recount the situation. About 19 or 20 captives now led these away, with about half a score of English captives. But ere they gone many steps, they dashed out the brains of the infant against a tree, and several of the other captives, as they began to tire in the sad journey, were sent unto their long home. Any instance of despair, rebuttal, or complaint by the captives had been met with swift and merciless death. Hannah and Mary had not the time to process the tragedies they had borne witness to, and shuffled ahead with Hannah operating on merely an instinctual level, having experienced such trauma this harrowing morning that she had disassociated, her mind incapable of processing the abrupt murder of her newborn child or the likelihood that her husband and remaining children had been killed as well, or were in a similar position to the one she now found herself in. 
As they pressed on, the mutilated corpse of an English settler appeared before them. His skull caved in and his body disemboweled. He had encountered the raiding party alone that morning on their approach to the settlement. Hannah clutched at the arm of Mary, and they had both stopped their march for mere seconds to look upon the ghastly sight before one of their captors raised his axe, gave them a look of displeasure, and the Puritan women hurried forward past the grisly remains. Alongside the women now walked a boy, who looked to be around fourteen years of age, roughly the same age as Hannah's son Nathaniel. At first glance, he appeared to be Abenaki. His dark hair fell down below his shoulders. He wore a deerskin mantle and a pair of unraveling slacks. But when Hannah locked eyes with the boy, she could see that he, too, was English. That boy was Samuel Leonardson, and he had been captured by the Abenaki in Worcester, Massachusetts, two years prior. They traversed the countryside in silence, passing through meadows, brooks, and ice-covered streams. The air grew even colder as the sun set on the horizon. A band of Abenaki who had been separated from the journey rejoined the party, and the natives began adorning themselves with animal furs about their legs and heads, preparing to travel through the night to an Abenaki village across the snow-covered terrain that now lay before them. There, the captives could be sold to the French as easily as beaver pelts, then placed into domestic slavery or traded back to the English for French prisoners. Just as it felt that Hannah's body could carry on no more, an Abenaki sachem called them to a halt amidst an ice-covered swamp to rest for the night, after what she had estimated to be roughly a dozen arduous miles into the wilderness of Havril. As a fire was lit, the image of young Martha being held by her ankles and swung forth into the trunk of a large tree like a bullwhip singed her mind. Hannah bowed her head and recited from the Gospel of Luke. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. The Abenaki sachem who had executed the infant child came over to where Hannah and the settlers had gathered in prayer. A necklace of bear claws jangled as he made his way to them. The orange hue of the fire brushed upon his face, and he stared forward through black, sunken eyes and said with a mocking tone in broken English, What need you trouble yourself? If your God shall have you delivered, you shall be so. After the fourth day of being driven through the wilderness, Hannah's hope of rescue by a party of English militia sent after them had been all but erased. Of the thirteen captured Puritans, including the infant Martha Dutton, only eight still endured. And for them, it would take a miracle to be delivered back home. But the fate of Hannah Dustin and the kidnapped New England settlers is, for tonight, another story for another time. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, and become a subscriber. Also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes, as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking on the Join button, or click the link in the description below to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.